October when I confirmed my schedule of video topics for November. I put in a placeholder for bringing awareness to the Mi'kmaq First Nation conflict going on in Nova Scotia. I'd heard about this on TikTok and I particularly caught it my empathy because I had studied a little bit of Mi'kmaq history and culture for my second novel, Dulcie's Legacy, which involves a native girl from the past in Nova Scotia. What I thought I would do was post a pointer to their causes, their videos of arson, bullying, intimidation, ramming boats, and stealing equipment by non-native fishermen, and ask people to send money, or if they wanted to buy Dulcie's Legacy, I'd donate all proceeds from those sales in November, Native American Heritage Month, to the Sibegnegity GoFundMe. However, you know what happened? Between the spike in violence and intimidation mid-October and my time to film, a deal for a consortium of seven native bands and a BC-based fishing group to buy out Clearwater in Canada for a billion dollars went through. Now the non-native fishermen who are angry at the treaty rights of small native boats to fish year-round for a moderate livelihood and who were prepared to become criminals to prevent those livelihoods, many of them now work for the native-owned Clearwater. It's not over, and as Chief Mike Zach of the Spegnegity Band said to the particularly annoying reporter asked about dropping their lawsuits, but I'll let him tell it. Any, uh, any arrangement that we do end up coming to does not change the fact that, uh, you know, criminal acts took place and our people went through some definite hardship. So uh, unless one of those, um, you know, agreements had a time machine, then it doesn't change anything. Welcome back to my channel, Booktube. This is Margaret. Thanks for coming by. I was hoping to stop by and talk to Amanda, and then I started browsing. I had in mind the goal of getting an oil change because I'm going on a long drive soon down to California. I got the oil change, and then I got a hot chocolate, and then I stopped by because I was right next to Amanda's bookstore. And I wanted to see how she was doing and browse for an hour and a half and went home and it was like almost a normal day. I mean, we were wearing masks and she couldn't let other people in and it wasn't normal normal. But I haven't had an outing like that in since June. So it was uh, one of those like heart well filling activities and I don't regret it in the slightest. <laughs> so anyway, yes, the purpose of this is to say here are some books that I got great deals on. It's used bookstore called Backstory Books and Yarn. If you are a yarny, Definitely call and ask. She's got changing stocks all the time and has a bead on lots of cool yarn for projects. So, yes. I I've sorted these according to, like, why I bought them. I don't know if that's the best way to go through this. We'll try that. So, I got several because uh, I was reminded after October how much I love reading books from other times. Sorry, my cat's investigating the bags that I brought these home in. October inspired a pile, so look at this. The Waverly Novels, so that's Walter Scott, and this is a very cool copy, although when I look at it, it's kind of like reading the Bible. The type is so small to fit all of the Waverly Novels in here, so I may need a magnifying glass with this, but it's one of those, like, you look at it, and it's printed in 1869, and it's $10, and this will give you a whole winter's worth of reading if you can stand it. So I really need to give Walter Scott a chance. So Waverly Novels. Very excited about this one because the first line and any page I open to basically makes me giggle. Let me, uh, let me read the first line and see if you can guess. The story is called The Sexes. The young man with the scenic cravat glanced nervously down the sofa at the girl in the fringed dress. She was examining her handkerchief. It might have been the first one of its kind she had seen, so deep was her interest in its material, form, and possibilities. The young man cleared his throat without necessity or success, producing a small, syncopated noise. 
Want a cigarette, he said. No, thank you, she said. Thank you ever so much just the same. <laughs> a scenic cravat. Is this a scenic cravat? I, I don't know. What is your opinion? And this is Laments for the Living by Dorothy Parker. And that was an accent directly taken from Kaylin CJ Temps on TikTok, who is hilarious. Uh, she does a mid-Atlantic accent for one of her, like her main character that she does skits for. And it's really funny. So Dorothy Parker, I have not read before. And this looked brilliant and very funny. Victober uh, brought me Jerome K. Jerome's Three Men in a Boat, which looked really funny and really short and referenced by a lot of other uh, books, but I'd never heard of it, really. I've heard of the author, but not the book. Excited. Uh, ha, ha, ha. I also have not read Anne Bronte, so Agnes Grey was the first one I found, and if this is the wrong order to read it and I should have read Tenet and Wildfell Hall first, well, maybe I'll get that and then read it first. Who knows? But... Yeah, that's, that's one to catch up on with my Brontes. And since everyone was on about George Eliot, especially Katie with books and things, um, no, especially Kate Howe and the George Eliot Fellowship, which was amazing, I picked up Daniel Deronda, which is quite a thick volume, and thought I'd give George Eliot another try, because Middlemarch was pretty good. I don't remember being fantastic, I just remember being like, enjoyable a few years ago so we'll we'll give her another try and see if that changes and then these other two are uh historical as well but not victorian a time of gifts by patrick lee farmore i've seen this um published series this what is it called new york review of books okay so this format and the way they design the covers is very distinctive, and so I've always, like, yearned after these because they just look so cool, which is a stupid reason. But also, these this series tends to be um, from the 20s, 30s, 40s, like, European writers that are often forgotten, um, many for probably good reasons, because they're supporting hateful views or whatnot. So basically, um, it's documenting the rise of fascism in Europe in 1933. So that might be pretty pertinent for today. And then I'd never heard of this before, but it was in the travel section, which I cannot stop stopping at. It's called The Stopping Places by Damien Labat, A Journey Through Gypsy Britain. It's someone who is from that community, but also sort of hearkening back to a lost lifestyle and time, because I'm pretty sure it's going to say all these places are vastly changed now. I thought that would be a, um, a really fascinating look and maybe fodder for future books, so writing books. I just feel so happy to be surrounded by these new books. It's, it's, it's a pile of possibilities that, like, so why do people like to be surrounded by books? I mean, if it doesn't verge on a hoarding complex, it's just the feeling that there's all this knowledge at your fingertips, that there's a place to turn to, that there's growth to be had, that there's reflective time uh, waiting in those pages for me. It's just learning about the world and having that possibility nearby. Of course, you have that with the internet, but, you know, the internet's become suspect. Number one, there's sort of a slimy feel about the internet and having to vet your sources and do all of that. That is different from the way, even if books are from an antiquated point of view, you have to vet them as well, but I feel like it's less slick. It's more honest in its outdated viewpoint, if you're looking at a book, you know? So I'll go into my research books next uh, while I pill on this book theory. It's something I think about every so often, and I don't really see booktubers reflecting the same attitude, which is interesting. But maybe I just haven't watched the right videos yet. Okay, research pile! So, <laughs> uh, I'm supposed to have The Octopus, which is book one of this series, but I got The Pit, which is book two. I think they can probably be read alone. This is by Frank Norris, and it was written in 1901. So this is kind of the Upton Sinclair era of muckrakers slash people interested in 
uh, labor movements and um, corruption, like the corruption that was the backlash against the first Gilded Age. So not only is this really good for the book I'm writing now, because this is about the wheat industry interacting with railroads, I think in Chicago is how Amanda explained it, but it's also great for thinking about how we're working now as a society and what we need to rethink. I know the name Frank Norris because the class ahead of me in high school had to read McTeague and I remember a lot of groaning about it, but I never read it, so I have no idea what he's like as a writer and am very excited to see, ooh, railroad barons and wheat middlemen in Chicago. This is going to be so amazing. <laughs> There's my nerd credentials. Did you need to see them? <laughs> All right, so one that's very close to what I'm doing right now. This is another book besides The Devil in the White City, if anyone is working on the 1893 Columbian Exposition, that they could read. This is a local author, actually, The Lake on Fire, who uh, looks at the Columbian Exposition from the viewpoint of a couple of Jewish kids from the countryside who have come to survive basically. So I thought this would be a lot of great detail. See if I can incorporate any of it. This looks kind of like a textbook. Maybe it is. Sikorsky, The Great American Land Bubble. So let's see when this was written. It's like 1930 something I think. 1932. The amazing story of land grabbing speculations and booms from colonial days to the present time. And because it's 1932 it's going to talk about even the uh, the bubbles in Florida speculation, which I just learned about this year, which was like fascinating, the crash of 29 and the binders that people were passing around because uh, loans were changing so fast. And, uh, you know, speculation pushes dividends, or I'm not sure about financial language, but uh, expectations so high that they're just impossible to meet. Anyway, I found that really interesting, and I thought history of that and the cycles of that would be a good, what's the word? When you eat a lot of sugar and you need some protein to, like, cut the sweetness. So if you are sick of the over-saccharine sweetness of political corruption today, just look back in the history to see how often we've done it before, and I don't know, maybe that'll offer some insight as to how to stop it from happening and have a more just society that is based in value and worth rather than speculation. All right, so this is a more well-known one, Brooks Without Straw. This is written right after uh, Reconstruction, so like 1880. 1876 was the election that unraveled the strength of the federal system, with federal soldiers leaving southern cities that were not reforming and Reconstruction basically falling apart. So having written or having published this in 1880 means he was writing right after all that happened. Eesh. This is going to be interesting because it's a white uh, judge in North Carolina who is writing about Reconstruction from the point of view of emancipated slaves. So radical for his time, but also probably hard to read for someone today. Um, the characterization and the outdatedness, I'll say. So I got this with a little bit of misgiving, but I think it'll be really valuable to sift through um, to get a feel for what language was being used, to get a feel for what the prevailing attitudes were in, in 1880. And that time is just, it just seems so crazy to me, kind of like now. So Albion Tourget. And finally, <laughs> our piece de nerdy resistance, uh, Railroads and American Law. So, uh, James W. Eli Jr. This is a little more up-to-date than the Land Grab book. This is from 2001. And, I mean, if you are looking for a history of policy making in a certain area and corruption and efforts to stop it and, I don't know, what, uh, what I was talking about in other research books, this is a analysis of it. It's not the text. It's a resume. It's a summary of 180 years or so. And the basis for a lot of other types of laws in America, because railroads were the first, well, canals were, I guess, but the first type of 
corporate enterprise. And so the way people pooled money, the way they did taxes, the way a lot of things have developed, I think is related back to how this was first set up. And so that's what had me very interested in this, as well as the period under investigation in Chicago in the 1890s um, and what the railroads were doing then to suppress uh, labor. It was winking at me from my pile by the cash register. Amanda told me that this was actually set aside for the old guys that come in and are looking for some random subject, but I took it away. <laughs> okay, Victober influences, research influences. How many books do I have left? Um, still a lot. Let's see. How about readers that I've met? I might have mentioned that I work with A Mighty Blaze. I volunteer and have worked for them doing festival work, so literary festivals like Sanibel Island Writers Conference and uh, Salem Literary Festival and Brattleboro uh, Literary Festival in Vermont. Um, they were all going virtual and wondering how to do that, and so we helped them set up and broadcast. Doing that, I have met this lovely person, Jenna Plum, Those Who Save Us. It's a World War II aftermath, complex moral landscape, uh, and after reading Stephen Kiernan's um, The Baker's Secret, I feel like those, those will probably go together well. They were in conversation in one of the first Mighty Blaze interviews I saw, and it just, they make me crack up, and they also make me feel I saw this and it had just come in and I was like, obviously this is meant for me. Jenna Blum is a fabulous person. I'll be talking with her soon. Another person we did an interview with was Margot Livesey and I found her book, The Flight of Gemma Hardy. And she is a Scottish writer who is now living on the East Coast and she was lovely. I got to chat before and she was just very nice. I had read Eve Moves the Furniture uh, several years ago and knew that I liked that. This is much more recent and also takes place in Scotland, so I mean. And I am a historical fiction writer, and so I tend to look out for other historical fiction writers. And two wonderful ladies that on the East Coast put together something called the Historical Fiction Happy Hour on Crowdcast, and they've been doing that once a month for... I don't know, most of the pandemic. It's delightful. They're super fun. They do cocktails. They do drinking games. They do uh, show and tell. They do kiss, marry, kill. They do Mad Libs for famous passages. It's just like hilarity for the whole hour. So Carrie Callahan is the person I knew who I originally started watching these for, but her co-host was Linnea Hartsaker, and she has a whole series about Vikings, and I saw this, and I was like, well... Obviously, reader I now know, so we got their book. Very excited. I don't know much about, like, Viking history. The last happy hour, they were all about the Viking history, combining with, like, cannibal tales and Arctic expeditions, and I was like, whoa, whoa, I don't know. I think there's a cat on board, and that was also one of the selling points. <laughs> I think we'll save the rest for later, because there's still more. But those are three good categories. And this was my massive book haul from Backstory Books and Yarn, and you should definitely check out their Instagram and website and order books from them too. You won't regret it. Thanks for stopping by. Hope you're reading good books, and I'll talk to you soon. It uh, simply continues to allow uh, the white community to have the Aboriginal community as second-class citizens in this province, in this nation, and that's just not acceptable. We're not going to put up with it anymore, and we're going to stand our ground. So we are optimistic that our discussions will go well in, in the number of weeks coming.